Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start off with my cases on uh, say artifacts. Uh, I have revealed my topic, but I'm sure it's not going to be a spoiler. Uh, look at the cases. Uh, first one is a 60 year old gentleman who was admitted to the hospital with a fracture. And uh, the second patient is a 45 year old woman who was evaluated for non-specific symptoms, including fatigue. Uh, both of them didn't have any uh, history of thyroidal illnesses. Let's look at the uh, investigations. As you can see here, both of them had elevated TSH values. The first patient's TSH was 198, and the second patient's TSH was 148, so very much elevated. Uh, look at the free T4. So both were within the normal range. And uh, the first patient showed a positive thyroid peroxidase antibody levels. It was 496. And uh, the second patient's antibodies were negative. And uh, she also had a couple of uh, tiny uh, thyroid nodules. Uh, so with that uh, introduction, the cases, so I'd like to uh, just speak about the fundamentals of the thyroid function test assays. When it comes to the TSH, it's a two-site or a sandwich format assay. So there's a capture antibody and a detection or a labeled antibody. And uh, the analyte, which is the TSH, it acts as a bridge between the two antibodies. When it comes to the free hormones, free thyroid hormones, T4 and T3, uh, so we are unable to use the same uh, assay. It's not a sandwich assay because the particles are very tiny, they're small particles, and uh, the concentrations are very low relative to uh, was excess of the bound analyte. So because of that, we use a different type of assay, it's a competition assay. Uh, when to consider spuriously, spurious TFTs? When thyroid function tests do not correlate with the clinical picture, or when there is a discrepancy between different thyroid function tests, or if the trend is changing, you know, compared to the previous, previous thyroid function tests, if the trend is changing, we need to consider spurious TFTs. We need a great degree of suspicion as whenever we encounter uh, this type of TFTs. But also, we need to have a very close dialogue between the physician and the chemical pathologist. Uh, interpretation of the majority of TFTs is straightforward, but occasionally uh, as we encounter uh, these abnormal or anomalous TFTs, and there are you know, different terms, terminology for this type of TFTs. This is a very uh, practical algorithm which was published in 2013 as how to proceed with uh, discordant TFTs. So, at the beginning, uh, step, the first step would be to uh, consider, exclude uh, different confounding factors, and then we need to uh, we need to consider assay interference before proceeding to various sophisticated uh, you know excluding various other sophisticated diagnoses uh, genetic or acquired disorders of the HPT axis. Uh, these are some of the, uh, the the full spectrum, nearly the full spectrum of thyroid assay interference. Uh, that would, I'd like to just give a very brief summary. Uh, different uh, diagnoses are there. Uh, antibodies could be formed against any constituent of the thyroid function assay, uh, in, and the analyte, different analytes, the TSH and the free hormones. Uh, antibodies could be, could be formed against TSH, as that's seen in macro TSH, and uh, the biotin, so there are no antibodies there, but biotin per se can interfere with the uh, analysis, uh, the assay, and uh, so biotin is used as an immobilizing agent uh, in the assay, and uh, again, treptoridine, so that's again used as uh, an immobilizer, antibodies could be formed against that, uh, so we use it as a complex biotin and streptoridine. Uh, ruthenium is used as, uh, it's actually, it's used as a label. So antibodies can be formed against ruthenium as well. And uh, 
for against the thyroid hormones T4 and T3. Uh, against those also antibodies, autoantibodies could be formed, and there are heterophil antibodies. These ones, in these conditions, we see antibody formation. And uh, a few other uh, conditions where uh, we see uh, due to a genetic mutation, there's alteration of the binding proteins. So uh, different changes, alteration's take place uh, due to uh, variants of uh, transport protein variants. Uh, several drugs also can alter TFTs due to different mechanisms, either by displacing uh, free hormones, uh, so that's one mechanism, or they could alter the thyroid binding globulin levels altering the, mainly affecting the total hormones. So there are so many drugs which could alter the PFTs and uh, due to uh, mutations, in there are, uh, can give rise to TSH variants. And also paraproteins can give rise to alteration in the PFTs. So this diagram shows different sites at which these interferences take place. Uh, it's very nicely, it summarizes uh, all the interferences. So let's come back to the case. So there was this suspicion of a spuriously elevated TSH because the patients, both of them were clinically ill thyroid despite having a markedly elevated TSH. So let's look at the follow-up of the second patient. As TSH was high at the beginning. So based on that, thyroxine was started. And as you can see, uh, you know, the dose of thyroxine had been, uh, uh, you know, despite uh, increasing the dose of thyroxine, the TSH had remained to be high. And uh, coming back to the case one, so there the TSH was repeated on a different analytical platform. So it's a very useful way of you know, approaching this problem because uh, you know, the antibodies that are used for the assay would be different. But here, but even after repeating it on a different platform, TSH remained to be high, so it was 122. And the second patient, when it was repeated on a different platform, as you can see here, TSH was found to be suppressed it, it was 0.0, .0 as you know what has happened here with a increased free T4. So case one, the serum was serially diluted and uh, so there was over recovery, so which means that the ultimate TSH after dilution, it was high, 165. So that's called oh, having an over recovery, whereas uh, in case two, case two also after dilution, uh, the exact value is not given there, but there was no linear pattern. So another word for that is not having parallelism. So that's very typical of, you know, when there are antibodies, the linear pattern we don't see. And in the first patient, rheumatoid factor was borderline positivity was there. And in the second patient, it was positive. Another test had been done uh, in case one. The patient serum was incubated with a heterophil uh, blocking tube with the blocking agent, and there was high recovery, 95% recovery, which means that the ultimate TSH after the incubation, it was again high, so which means that the blocking agent was not, did not compatible. So whatever the antibody or the, the interference that is there, it was not compatible. So that's why we have a high recovery. So it was not done uh, in the second case. And then peg precipitation was done. Polyethylene glycol, so when you add it, it decreases the solubility of the proteins and it precipitates. So when PEG precipitation was done, there was under recovery in the first case, which means that the TSH, the result was low after precipitation, after the precipitation. And the second case also showed a similar 
low recovery, which means that uh, there had been some kind of, a, you know, either antibodies or immunoglobulins which were precipitated. So this is a very good test, but it is non-specific, and it doesn't differentiate between different diagnoses. Uh, now, in the first case, another test had been done. So that's the gel filtration chromatography, and it was suggestive of macro TSH, but again, we have to remember that uh, this test also shows poor specificity. Gel filtration depends on the uh, size of the molecules, and it says that uh, the macro TSH and heterophyll antibodies, the differentiation based on this test is not that great. So, but it was suggestive of macro TSH. And after that, in the first patient, uh, very characteristic test had been done. The patient sample was intubated with a sample from a normal hypothyroid patient. So we expect the TSH in that sample to be high. So at one-to-one -one ratios, it was intubated for one hour and you know we the, the, the result, so there was a low recovery, gave a low TSH lower than the expected value for the combined samples. So that's a characteristic test. And uh, with the help of the manufacturer, anti-animal and heterophyll antibodies were checked and they were absent. Coming back to the second patient, uh, so after getting a suppressed ESH on the second platform, uh, thyroxine was stopped. And three months later, TF TFTs were repeated on the second again on the second platform and they were perfect. Does anyone want to come up with the diagnosis at this stage? I think we've got enough data I mean, for us to come to a reasonable diagnosis. Okay, uh, the first patient had macro TSH. The second patient had antibody interference due to IgM, rheumatoid factor. Mind you, uh, the rheumatoid factor, the TH was very high. It was strongly positive. I didn't want to mention that at the beginning because you, you know the, I wanted to keep you in suspense. So that's why I didn't mention the rheumatoid factor TH is strongly positive. Macro TSH, there are antibodies against TSH and they form complexes. They are quite big. As they are unable to get filtered in the glomerulus, they stay within the uh, circulation. Uh, whereas heterophyll antibodies, you know, we use different terminology, different terms are used imprecisely, interchangeably. Heterophyll, uh, sorry, human anti-animal antibodies are monospecific, so with high affinity, monospecific, directed against animal epitopes. Whereas heterophyll antibodies, they, are, they have weak affinity and they are polyspecific antibodies with no prior exposure to any animal antigen. And these antibodies, they cross-link uh, the capture antibody and the detection antibody. This cross-linking is there, whereas the macro TSH, there's no cross-linking. So that's the uniqueness of macro TSH. And uh, the rheumatoid factor IgM is, is considered as a subtype of heterophilic antibodies. Uh, if you can remember earlier, when I mentioned that uh, there, there was over-recovery uh, in the first patient with macro uh, TSH. So the reason was that uh, once it's diluted, the TSH bound to the complex are released. So that's why you get over recovery. So that's a characteristic finding in macro TSH. And uh, again, uh, when you uh, incubate it with the normal hypothyroid sample, with a normal hypothyroid sample with a high TSH, why we got a low value was that it, the complexes act as a sponge. So the TSH, the TSH from the normal sample gets uh, incorporated into the uh, complex. So those are unique findings, uh, the differentiating methods uh, when it comes to uh, macro TSH. Once a C interference is established, differentiating between these two mechanisms is simply academic. Uh, however much sophisticated these tests are, we need to remember that these tests are not flawless. 
uh, over about four decades, about uh, you know, 150 cases of thyroid interference had been there, the published cases had been there, and uh, only 8%, uh, 8% of the cases only, you know, it showed without any clinical consequence, which means it shows the, the gravity of the problem. Doctor, Doctor Demotu, if we can, if we can just uh, uh, hasten. Yeah. So this is the last slide. This is the proposed algorithm, you know, to screen for assay interferences. But you know, in our settings, we may not be able to follow exactly the same method. But if you try to understand the mechanism of assay interference, I think you know we will be able to use the available tests intelligently. These are some of the references you know, which I have used for my cases and the, the discussion. I think it's quite worth uh, having a read through. Thank you.